Hello, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, data site uh, IG, uh, IGSN uh, webinar, um, really sort of focusing on uh, the IGSN ID um, that was, uh, uh, you know, and the partnership between uh, the two organizations. Um, our speakers today are myself, uh, Jens Klump, Sean Ross and Penny Crook, and I'll let each one of them introduce themselves as they start uh, their presentations. Um, uh, but before we sort of really jump into everything, let me just give a little bit of housekeeping. Um, firstly, um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, say hello to people, who you are, where you're from, etc. For any questions you have coming from the presentations, please use the, the Q&A functionality. We will have a little bit of time at the end for, for questions, but we will um, I, it might be a little bit difficult for me, but my colleagues will certainly try and answer questions maybe as we go along as well and keep an eye on that. Um, when we do, when you exit the webinar, you will be uh, given a short participant survey. Please do spend a couple of minutes if you can, just, just filling that in because it's really useful for us uh, to know a little bit about your experiences of the webinar. Um, and to make it very clear, the video and slide deck will be shared to, through the Datasite YouTube channel and our Zenodo community, respectively. So I think that's everything I need to say. So maybe we, we get going. Uh, so um, my name is Rory Edmonds. I'm the sample community manager here at Datasite. I'm leading the partnership between uh, Datasite and the IGSN EV, and, I, and that'll I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on. Um, but really what I'm going to do here is sort of set the scene and, and we're going to try and sort of tell a nice story as we move through. So this is really just the introductory part of what IGSN IDs are. So IGSN stands for International Generic Sample Number. So the IGSN ID is glo a globally unique and persistent identifier for all material samples. It's domain agnostic, so samples can be from any material from anywhere in the universe. And this is why I've really tried to make that very clear in the title of this webinar, because um, although the IGSN had its roots within the geosciences, it really, really is for all material types from all disciplines. And to sort of really compound that, um, I've I'm not saying that this is comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination and there will be crossover among disciplines, but here's just some thinking, some examples of sort of disciplines and material sample types. So here you can see the sort of physical sciences, the earth space, environmental sciences and chemistry and some of the sorts of material samples that might be collected by those communities. Likewise, in the life sciences, so biochemistry, microbiology, botany, zoology, ecology, et cetera, et cetera, um, here's a list of the sorts of things that they might collect as material samples, remembering that this will include live specimens, which is quite uh, an important uh, class of, of, of specimen or sample. Um, here's a few uh, different types of samples from uh, the social sciences, sociology, anthropology, archaeology, et cetera, et cetera, and from applied sciences, um, for example, agriculture and material sciences, engineering, medicine. And finally, we could even think about this in the arts, so architecture, ceramics, sculptures, those kind of things, um, and so on and so forth. And there are probably more sample types that, and disciplines that I haven't listed here, but here's that's just to really, really bring it home that this we really are talking about all sample types, all disciplines. Now we we don't have just have to think about individual samples here. We could be thinking about collections or aggregates. You may not want to have a persistent identifier for every object, but rather the collection. So you need to think about the granularity here, especially the scale of material samples can be much larger than that of, of data. Um, IGSN IDs can also be used for what we call features of interest. Now, these are basically collection sites. So, for example, in the geosciences, that might be a borehole or a well or something like that. So something that you're not actually taking from the environment back to the lab, but necessary, but, the, but actually the place where the sampling took place. And this comes from um, an ISO standard and, SOSA, and the SOSA ontology, where really a specimen is a specialization of this feature of interest upon where which the sampling activity was carried out. 
And the sample is then really a representative of that feature of interest and can, can be considered a child or subsample of it. The material itself doesn't have to be persistent. We know that samples can be destroyed during the analytical process or might be thrown away ultimately. So it can be used for those kind of samples as well. But of course, the metadata connected with that sample should really provide information on what the current status of the sample is. And a few quick uh, sort of use cases and how uh, sort of you incorporate IGSN IDs into workflows. So the first use case is really linking to the web. So why? Well, this is obviously part of open science. You want to know the sample exists, information is available, your past investment remains useful, um, and that unique samples are preserved long term alongside the data related to them. So in this case, the, the landing page is a digital representation of the sample. It contains a description of the sample identified by the IGSN ID. So here you're really connecting the, the physical um, with the, the digital. Um, the presentation on the on landing pages, of course, may, may differ amongst different portals, different catalogs, but you really want to improve discoverability as much as possible. And, and there are sort of lots of ways of doing that. But we also realize that there might be reasons why you don't want to share some of the information. So there might be parts that are uh, sensitive for some reason because they're of a commercial interest or a vulnerable site or so on and so forth. So those could obviously also be excluded from that, uh, that information. The second use case is location, sort of collection management. What do you have? What can be made discoverable? Um, ensuring that your available resources are discoverable, both internally and externally. And it's really about knowledge sharing. So there's not necessarily a common standardized, standardized infrastructure for field work and sample management. And the, the knowledge can be often with the PI and disappear with the PI. Um, and there are sort of var various simple ways to link a material sample with its digital representation. You could permanently affix a label to the sample. Uh, or to its container, you could write or engrave the, the IGSN ID onto the, onto the sample or its container. Um, and, and this can include a, a local accession and inventory numbers as well as the ID. It can be convenient to use QR codes and barcodes that actually encode the IGSN ID as an actionable URI because this offers then a machine readable ref identification. But we also know that, that samples are often handled by humans. And so Ideally, if you're even if you're having a QR code with the IGSN ID, you also may want everything in a human readable way as well. Uh, the third use case is tracking, and this is really about sample process management. Um, so we know that that uh, there are lots of local systems for unique identification within an organization and, and these sample names can be quite ambiguous for anybody external and they can change. We know that in the field it can be given one sample ID and when, when it reaches the facility it might be given another one as it goes through various analytical processes it may be given more. Um, so it can really be difficult to track samples across institutional and system boundaries. Um, and the most effective way to really avoid any ambiguity is to apply IGSN IDs as early as possible. So really in the field, you could think about using electronic field notebooks to document your sample process and actually assign the IGSN IDs as part of the field sampling. And uh, Penny will talk a little bit more about, oh no, so Sean will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, uh, you can encode the IGSN ID into, into a suffix of, of the, the ID to really match the specific sampling campaign. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and this really enables samples to be tracked through different stages of the life cycle and as they physically move from place to place. The fourth use case is uh, really cross-linking and citation. So discovery and credit. You want to unambiguously link samples with data and literature. You want to unambiguously link parents and children. Um, and there's a the, the pro big problem at the moment that the citation is not really consistent in the literature. And this is something that we need to, to work on. But IGS and IDs enable those relationships to be described between a sample, its, its data sets and publications, and also um, with its, its children. Um, so samples are cross-linked through uh, the, the, in the metadata through the related identifier type. You can integrate references and data sets as active web links. 
um, to link online sample descriptions. You can include in data set metadata to enable discovery in catalogs of research data repositories and portals that are harvesting metadata. And the final is this features of interest, which I mentioned before, which is linking the collection sites with the samples. So you want to identify related entities closely linked to the material sample. And, and we're not so so again, we're not just talking about the physical objects that are the samples themselves, but also where the samples could have been taken from. Um, and you can individually identify the feature of interest and the sample through different IDs and then again relate them using the related identifier uh, metadata to mirror hierarchical relationships. And then finally, very, very briefly, you can use IGSN IDs everywhere in the sample workflow. However, it's really important in, for a lot of sample types that, again, the field work is really the place where the sample management begins. And so in the field, you might pre-assign a batch issue uh, IGSN IDs in a draft state, especially you might have limited metadata or internet connection. And again, using in some sort of encoding in QR codes and, and or barcodes and via field-based tools such as FAME, which again, Sean will, will touch on in a moment. Um, and then beyond that, you again, you may want to use these QR codes, barcodes at each stage to track pro progress. Um, you may want to integrate IGSN IDs in your analytical systems such that they, they have access to sample descriptions. And the one of the nice things is that you can incorporate your local naming conventions to it to transform locally unique identifiers into globally unique ones. And so there, therefore, you don't necessarily have to change your established working procedures, naming conventions or data systems. So uh, that I hope that gives everybody a reasonably nice overview. I'm now going to hand over to Sean Ross, who will talk a bit about uh, FAMES 3 implementation in IGSN. So over to you, Sean. Thanks, Rory. Uh, so I'm uh, Sean Ross, um, and uh, I'm a professor of history and archaeology at Macquarie University in Sydney, uh, and also co-director with Penny of the FAMES uh, project, which I'll talk a little bit about now. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So, and I, I hope it's not too noisy there. I'm in a hotel in Canberra and uh, they seem to be doing some drag racing or motorcycle tuning or something downstairs that of course just started before this. So I hope it's not too distracting or that my noise canceling is good enough. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, so uh, Fames, um, we're uh, a research, inf uh, we started out as a uh, research infrastructure um, project in 2012 focused on archaeology um, and uh, essentially our, our software was developed for offline field data capture android devices um, and offering customizable workflows and i think that's a key point there that it's sometimes um, uh, hard for us to communicate succinctly uh, that we weren't really a mobile app we were a platform for minting mobile apps so you would specify uh, your workflow you would specify your data schema um, and um, uh, and at the time you did that using an XML file, XML files, you'd specify those things and then you would generate uh, a, a custom Android application based on that. Um, and uh, this was focused on field research in the sense that we um, built a number of research specific features uh, like the ability to bind different uh, data types into the um, uh, bind different data types into the same record so you weren't limited to a map driven workflow or a form driven workflow and you uh, you could do any combination of those things uh, plus manage multimedia um, and do other things like uh, annotate um, not only individual records but even individual fields with quite granular metadata sort of mim mimicking the back of the recording sheet or the margins of the notebook um, that kind of thing um, and uh, and uh, finally, like what uh, where IGSN really comes into this, I, I think, is that we also made a great effort to uh, incorporate. Uh, we we predate fair data uh, by a few years, uh, but incorporate open science, open scholarship approaches. Um, 
uh, at the time it was more open link data uh, approaches and maintaining data provenance and a few other things we more uh, explicitly embraced fair after that was released a few years later um, and combining that with um, uh, device support and I'll explain in a minute how that uh, feeds into the uh, into the IGSN um, so uh, part of the open scholarship uh, uh, part um, grew into, it wasn't initially sort of thought of this way, but especially after fair, after the FAIR principles were published uh, into allocating PIDs in the field. Um, aside from that, let me just say a few more things about FAMES, and then I'll get more into the IGSN implementation. Um, open source, um, the, the, software, the old software was uh, GPL v3, the new software that I'll mention in a minute is Apache 2.0, and uh, we've, uh, we've been quite committed to the um, idea that these definitions of your data and workflow are shareable on GitHub and machine, and they're intrinsically machine readable, um, and uh, that they encapsulate important meta or paradata on their own uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the data schema and the uh, workflow as it was actually implemented in the field. Um, since we came out, our use expanded beyond archaeology to geoscience and ecology. I've highlighted those because those may be the most relevant to IGSN, but also ethnography, linguistics, and oral history, uh, and more recently, agriculture and a few and soil science, a few other things. Um, we've been customized for 70 workflows uh, on 40 projects. Um, but the old version of our software is uh, at the at end of life. It's been at end of life for a couple of years. And so in 2020, the Australian Research Data Commons uh, and other partners joined a platforms project and um, uh, invested in uh, in FAMES to rebuild it uh, in a modern stack. And that's now in uh, using modern components. And that's now in um, uh, in beta. Um, and going forward to try to make this more uh, sustainable, we're going to be using a commercial open source model that uh, I'd be happy to talk about, um, and that will uh, will begin um, uh, offering software uh, fames as a software service uh, rebranded as Fieldmark uh, starting next year. Uh, and next slide, please. Um, so just uh, I've already prefigured a lot of this, uh, um, so I think I can do it pretty pretty quickly. Uh, beginning in 2016, we implement we helped partners uh, initially Cyro uh, Geochemistry uh, Jens and his team um, to uh, implement IGSNs into a geochemical uh, environmental sampling workflow for for uh, geochemistry. Um, and uh, what we did there was essentially expanded, uh, extended FAMES to include uh, QR label scanning um, uh, and loading of records, uh, label printing via a, a, a portable Zebra Bluetooth printer, um, and tried a number of different ways of how you could do IGSN allocation in the field. Uh, and, um, you know, ultimately, uh, the, the thing that they settled on um, was, uh, 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 the, as, as the most efficient workflow, was essentially printing raffle books of IGSNs ahead of time, taking them out into the field, uh, sc and scanning those in. And you can see a, a, a screenshot of the uh, interface here, where we've got a scan label. And so they'd scan that uh, uh, in. Um, in FAMES 3, the new version, Fieldmark, um, we've got the QR label scanning uh, is, is currently in testing. Um, so, and we're really quite interested in the allocation of PIDs more broadly uh, in the field or prefiguring PIDs, like taking, uh, making, uh, conforming local identifiers to uh, a, the um, uh, a format or syntax that will, that works later to, um, you know, mint something like a, a, a DOI, for instance, but with IGSNs, we can really, we, we we're quite happy, I think, with this workflow where you can actually allocate them in the field. Um, so we're going to be using that hopefully across domains uh, starting next year. Um, and uh, yeah, that's IGSNs in FAMES. Thank you very much, Sean. So now we'll move on to uh, the history and future of the IGSN EV. So to give you a sort of a bit of a background of where this all came from and where it's going from as regards uh, the the uh, IGSN organization. So over to you, Jens. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rory. Um, let's move to the next slide. So th this first slide shows you the original use case why the geological community came up with this concept of a unique identifier for a sample. 
because when Kerstin Leonard at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University in New York started building the um, PetDB Petrology database, which later became part of EarthCam, um, she and her team noticed that some samples had many different names in the literature. Um, so you couldn't really be sure that the data that were reported on the sample were actually relating to that sample. And the other way around, um, the way that samples were labeled in a fairly ad hoc fashion in most sampling campaigns uh, led to not just duplication, but multiplication of names. So on that map on the right-hand side, it shows you locations of a sample called M1. And so M1 seems to be anything, anywhere. It's certainly not a unique, not very useful way of, of labeling and identifying samples. So this had to be solved. And this is why Kerstin Leonard in 2004 developed this concept of the international geosample number back then. And I will take you to, through some of the history of how we then ended up at the international generic sample number. Next slide, please. And one thing that um, work we um, realized very early on, of course, is that we could then use those unique names to um, not only retrospectively fit, make that fit between samples and data, but also do that right from the start by putting IGSNs into, into the literature, um, into tables or sample descriptions. Next slide. A parallel development that um, I was involved in while I was still working at GFZ Potsdam in the early 2000s was the development of DOI for data. It wasn't called data site back then. It was a pilot project funded by the German Research Foundation. And um, we um, looked at different alternatives of using persistent identifiers to identify data sets eventually settled on using DOIs and start building this um, system and, and um, evolving it. And this thing that started as a pilot project then in 2009 became data site. And then you know how that uh, history continued. It's still around today and uh, not too long ago, um, IGSN and data site joined the strategic partnership that Rory will talk about later. Um, but this is the historic context of where we started on a parallel path. It's important to note here that right at that moment in 2004, 2005, we did talk to TIB Hannover who were running this project, whether we could use DOI for samples. And uh, um, Irina Zenz, the deputy director, immediately understood the idea, but the way this was all set up, um, assigning DOIs to samples was out of scope. So we had to find a different solution and went for our own handle namespace. But in we still try to keep close to DOI um, because um, why reinvent the wheel? So next slide, please. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the concept of IGSN was developed at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And um, we, taking this experience that we had in Potsdam from using DI for data, um, I then continued to develop this concept further and acquired a handle namespace for IGSN and we started minting handles to identify samples. But then um, to, to grow this system and beyond just La Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and the project, um, we had to think a bit harder. And so in February, 2011, um, the, this project conducted a workshop at the San Diego Supercomputing Center to think about what, how can this become an infrastructure? 
because as a just as an um, as a project fund by the National Science Foundation, this probably won't be a persistent identifier system. And as I mentioned, using the OIs wasn't really an option at the time, also because the business model of the International DOI Foundation um, and and of um, yeah data side wasn't around yet. Well, I had had was just around, but also there business model was still evolving. So we kept with the handle space and um, but kept a close technical alignment with data site, uh, including reusing some open source software components. On the left hand side, excuse the fuzzy photograph, because when I took this picture in 2011, um, I took this as a note for myself, not as a historic document. But it showed this um, original sketch of how the services would link to each other from the from a collection to a local catalog to a global catalog and a registration agency and to the top right of that image you can see that we already thought about how we might do a transition from handle to doi so this has always been on the card but the historically things developed on parallel paths. Next slide, please. But we did follow the example of data site and start and founded an international organization. The founding event was at the American Geophysical Union meeting in December 2011 in San Francisco. And over time, the membership grew to about 20 organizations who then collectively registered more than 10 million IGSN IDs. IGSN continued to operate as a member-based organization, um, pretty much based on volunteer effort or in-kind contributions. But what we saw was that this model was, was becoming um, more and more strained because um, keeping the operations running, but in particular, the outreach required dedicated staff. You couldn't do this on the side as a in kind contribution. Um, so I want to remark that from a technical perspective, the service never had an outage since 2008. So we were maybe lucky, but also well set up and um, had very um, helpful contributions from our members. But this couldn't continue in this way. Next slide, please. Also, what we were now um, anticipating was that the number of samples would grow very quickly. When you think about that, it from the perspective of a scientific paper that is based on data, that is based on samples, then it's very rare that you have a one-on-one-on-one -on -one -on -one relationship. It's often the case that many data sets get um, interpreted together in a in a paper and each data set, it will be derived from many samples. And so this could mean that the number of um, samples that need to be identified easily scale into the billions of objects. And looking at the natural history collections, this is certainly the case. There are about 3 billion objects in the natural history collections. And that's only the museums. This is not working. Um, collections, labs, or other um, other repositories. Next slide, please. So, to to think about what to do next, um, we approached the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and in late 2018, we received a grant from the. Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to review our organizational and technical model. We then called the project IGSN 2040 for short, not the long title of the original proposal. So the project ran from 2018 to um, not early 2021 to the end of 2021, almost into 2022. Um, and this project explored models of organizational sustainability and technical changes that would allow IGSN to be expanded to more user communities 
and also to very large numbers of samples. So it was both um, looking at organizational growth and technical growth. And a key recommendation from IGSN 2040 was for IGSN to partner with a similar organization. Next slide, please. So we started some careful um, conversations in the background to approach organizations about partnering and got a very enthusiastic response from DataSite. Um, then um, in end of 2021, we had uh, progressed this proposal to a stage that we could present it to an extraordinary general assembly of the IGSN organization for a vote and the uh, members unanimously agreed on, the, on having this part, entering this partnership with DataSite. So in October, 2021, we signed a memorandum of agreement and formalized this partnership. So IGSN, the IGSN organization and DataSite entered this part, strategic partnership to operate and grow the technical operation of IGSN IDs for the identification of physical samples to make them traceable across organizational boundaries and for linking the specimens to the scholarly record. And this partnership is overseen by the IGSN data side partnership steering group, which um, has representatives from both organizations and Rory will speak about that a bit more. Next slide, please. This does ask the question, what's the future role of the IGSN organization now that the technical operation is carried by data side. There's still an important role for the organization. It's now changing its character from running a persistent identifier system to coordinate to a coordinating role where we work with different communities and as a commu community of communities. So having IGSN IDs now on a stable, sustainable base the IGSN organization can now focus on um, community engagement, develop uh, best practices for sample identification standards and um, adoption of these approaches in third party implementations and platforms. And it can do so by leveraging the data side ID registration services while at the same time maintaining the IGSN identity and brand, but freeing resources for this very important community advocacy effort. Um, next slide, and thank you. Thank you very much, Jens. So we'll move swiftly on. Um, and uh, thankfully, Jens has already covered a little bit of uh, what I was going to say so that uh, I can hopefully keep this quite brief. But I'm really going to sort of take over from Jens to talk a little bit more about what we've been doing over the past year in the IGSN data site partnership. So um, the timeline, the first part of the timeline you already saw. So the second half was after this partnership was formally announced, uh, we actually submitted a follow-up uh, proposal to the Sloan Foundation to get a grant to actually implement IGSN 2040. Um, so that was in November of last year, which was then uh, approved in December of last year, and the project actually commenced in January. Um, in February, March, uh, I was appointed as Samples Community Manager and my colleague Cody Ross was uh, in, uh, employed as the Application Support Engineer. So he's sort of my technical counterpart in all of this. Um, and the, the project is the this is initial phase of the project is or the, the project itself is due to end in 20, uh, April 2023. But of course, that doesn't mean the end of, of uh, this partnership. It's just the end of that particular project. The main actors, um, I, again, I don't think I need to go over this too much, but uh, DataSite is obviously providing the, 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 the registration services, ensuring the ongoing stability, sustainability of the IGSN ID infrastructure. As Jens mentioned, the, the IGSN EV is really looking to implement, promote standard methods. Um, and we've created this um, 
partnership steering group. So it was established by the data site and IGSN executive boards to really oversee the relationship in, described in the agreement and to be a formal advisory body to advise data site on the needs of the sampling community, of the samples community. And then me, as the samples community manager, I'm really responsible for that coordination with the, the uh, PSG and with the broader IGSN community to support adoption, advocacy, implementation activities. So the, the um, project itself is the sort of phase one of, of the partnership, and it's really been focused on the technical side of things, the technical transition. So these are the, 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 the things that we've really, really been looking at as over the past year under the project. And as you can see, nearly everything in, in this list is done. But the first step was really engagement, coordination with the current IGSM members to support the transition, develop a communicating timelines, introducing data site services, um, onboarding the, the IGSM allocating agents as data site members or consortium organizations, and then sort of moving into the sort of technical plans. So sharing documentation on technical and, and, and implementation. Um, firstly, with those IGSM members and then data site members, providing recommendations and namespace uh, on met metadata and namespaces, and really embedding IGSN IDs into the PID graph to ensure all the relational metadata support links uh, between the, the research, res research resources and outputs. Um, more recently, we've really started the transition. So we've got the, all the IGSN allocating agents using data site tools and APIs and services now for registering new IGSN IDs. We've launched the, the registration for, for members and consortium organizations and transitioned the IGSN handle server so that it's managed by data site over the long term so that things that did exist continue to resolve over time. And the part we're really working on is an aliasing. So everything that existed as an, under the handle server as an IGSN ID is being re-registered as a DOI IGSN ID and then an aliasing process between the two. Um, and so, yes, the, the big take home is the launch of the IGSN ID registration in September. Data site services for doing this for material samples was opened up to all data site members and consortium organizations. And we have made support documentation available, which continues to be improved and updated as we move forward. And then the second phase of the project is really what's partially what Jens was talking about is the scaling up and sustainability. So continuing not only to support the ongoing needs of IGS and ID registrants, but coordinating a strategy for discoverability of the IDs, scaling adoption and use of, the, of IGSN IDs across samples communities, and this community of communities of practice approach, where we're sort of hosting working groups, events, creating a knowledge base to, to help foster these communities of practice, developing best practices and recommendations, and core sample descriptive metadata and community extensions. And I'm going to leave Pe Penny to talk a, more uh, uh, about um, the the communities of communities because we she, she's um, sort of better placed to do so. But but basically those registering IGSN IDs are obviously invited to join the IGSN EV, but they're also invited to participate in domain specific communities of practice. And from a data site viewpoint, it's really how can the data site metadata schema be enhanced to better support material samples. We've launched an, an archaeology samples community of practice in March 2022 as a pilot, but I'm also working with life science colleagues to identify experts in biosamples, biodiversity communities of practice, and I'd be interested in any others that you happen to be want to create. These are just the ones I've been focusing on at the moment. So I will hand over to Penny Crook to talk more about the archaeology samples community of practice. Thank you, Rory. Uh, next slide, please. Just a quick introduction, uh, uh, well, to introduce myself. Um, my name is Penny Crook. I'm a historical archaeologist. I'm co-director of the FAMES project alongside Sean, uh, which is one of my main interests in this field. Uh, I do that on a part-time basis. So two days a week, I'm working in digital archaeology and the other uh, three days of a week, three days of the week, I'm an artifact specialist processing a lot of material culture that is excavated from urban sites uh, across Australia. Uh, so 
I'd like to talk about the um, archaeology samples community of practice. It actually began at the beginning of the year with an innocent uh, inquiry from one of our members about how to uh, adjust the IGSN uh, metadata for an archaeological sample in a German mining museum. The inquiry came through to Jens and Rory, who took that as an opportunity to get together all the archaeologists they knew working in this space and form a community of practice. So we actually started meeting formally in March and we've been uh, doing our best to meet monthly ever since. There's only seven of us at the moment, but we do actually cover a large number of uh, fields in archaeology from archaeological science, landscape archaeology, uh, and also most of us have a strong interest in archaeological data management. And we also um, cover all the archaeological eras from the prehistoric uh, through to the modern era, which is, is where I come in. Given our backgrounds, we have an interest in the physical sample management, um, as Rory was talking about at the beginning, and also managing the data and the publication in different repositories and how we can trace samples from the trench uh, through to um, the repository and also publications. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so we have, uh, we've identified some key goals. One is the general promotion of personal identifiers for material samples within archaeology. Uh, so if we achieve nothing else, it will be to raise the profile of the need to have persistent, persistent identifiers in archaeological data management. We also would like to um, start working towards a, a bit of a catalogue of use cases in archaeology for um, how physical samples are managed and how they're recorded. We're interested in the good stories and also some of the um, less, less good stories, the poorer ones. Uh, so that's another key goal. And the most concrete um, thing that we're planning to do is actually start getting stuck into the metadata profiles for IGSNs and work out what specific archaeological uh, knowledge or facets need to go into that system. We don't think there'll be too many, but it's, it's important to sit back and look at that. Some of the challenges for archaeology, um, independent of other fields, of course, uh, we well to begin with the um, what's not so much of a challenge, but what we share with a range of other disciplines is a lot of the material uh, samples that we collect is done in a number of different fields, and we don't need any special uh, tools to do that. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. If there's a process that works well in other disciplines, we want to share that, learn from that and bring that knowledge into the archaeological community. We do have some challenges and Rory um, alluded to some of those earlier. We have physical samples that end up in a lab and they're analysed and they're split and we need to track them. We also have the opportunity to uh, treat individual artefacts and shards as samples and there's a challenge there in the uh, granularity in which we might record that. So as an artifact specialist, I absolutely must know which uh, artifacts come from which trench, but capturing IGSNs for every individual shard when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands on a site uh, is possibly a challenge too big. So we need to focus on where that granularity sits best for us. A final challenge for us is, the, um, is our community, which has a lower interest in using personal identifiers across the board, I think that's fair to say. So there is a socio-cultural challenge um, to uh, bring knowledge about this general field into archaeology and then the more specific challenge of physical sample management. Next slide, please. So uh, we've been meeting since March, as I mentioned, and up to now, we've mostly been focused on sharing our own stories and some tools and, and things that we all use. We do think it's time to step up and reach out and perhaps get some more folks involved in our community of practice. We gave a uh, birds of a feather presentation at the most recent eResearch Australasia conference in October, and uh, we've started getting some newsletter articles out. Shortly, we're going to be working on a survey so that we can start collecting some of those use cases across the field of archaeology and um, put out a call to have more members join our group. If there are any archaeologists uh, joining us this evening and you're interested in, in joining us, 
on a monthly basis, getting involved in the survey or any kind of interest that you have, please get in touch with Rory. We would love to welcome you on board. Thank you, Rory. That's it from me. Thank you very much, Penny. That's lovely. Right. So um, wary of the time, I will get jump straight into the very last bit, which is uh, a slightly more technical talk uh, looking at uh, IGSN IDs in, in data site systems. Um, and please, again, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. At the moment, I haven't seen any, but I haven't been looking at it very closely. Lots of interesting uh, discussion in the chat. But uh, yeah, please add questions to the Q&A if you have them. Um, so I want to thank my colleague Cody Ross for putting together these slides. Um, and in saying that, I give the caveat that I may not be as polished as he would be in giving them. But um, the, the point here is really we want to make it very clear that um, that IGSN IDs are basically the same, have the same functionality as DOIs. So they can be registered using the same data site API, APIs and Fabrica inf in interfaces that data site offers for DOIs. They can also appear in data site commons, in REST API queries and other discovery interfaces, just like DOIs can. And here's a look at how an IGSN ID appears in Fabrica, which is Datasite's web interface for account and DOI management. Much like DOIs, IGSN IDs can be updated from this interface using, using both an easy to use form and a file upload feature. Um, IGSI ID metadata can also be explored and exported in different formats. Um, so this screenshot is also from Fabrica. Um, it displays the data site XML metadata for the example IGSN ID shown in the previous slide. Um, and IGSN ID sample metadata is in obviously encoded in the data site metadata schema in the same way that DOIs are. However, specific metadata requirements for material samples have been put forth by a, basically a partnership working group. Um, and we'll go over those recommendations very briefly uh, next. So here we're outlining the recommendations for IGSN IDs in the mandatory properties of the data site metadata schema. And things of note here are, um, since discovery is important, titles, for example, might contain local sample identifiers, materials, the basic form of the object. Um, with IGSN IDs, the resource type general is always physical object. Um, and the resource type is suggested to be either material sample or feature of interest, really to distinguish between those two concepts. Um, and highlighting a few recommended properties, the subject can contain materials that compose the sample. The date properties should contain log events relevant to the sample, like collected dates and destroyed dates. Um, related identifiers pointing to other IGSN IDs registered within data site services use the relation identifier type of DOI. Um, descriptions with uh, the abstract description type uh, can be used to describe a sample at its birth, whilst methods can be used to outline collection processes. And geolocation can be used to record where a material sample was collected, even though we obviously know that some samples may be synthesized and hence really non-geographic. Um, so uh, like DOIs, IGSN IDs can be registered with uh, related identifier metadata to connect sample identifiers to other resources with PIDs. Uh, the first related identifier here connects the sample to another IGSN ID to which this sample is a part. And we'll in a moment just show how the part metadata is represented in the PID graph and the GraphQL API. The second the related identifier connects the sample to a data set in which the sample is cited. This connection is represented in the data in data site commons in the same way as any other citation relationship for a DOI. Uh, the third here connects this IGSN ID to domain specific metadata about the sample. So no specific, no metadata standard could capture all of the complexities of the myriad ways for describing material samples. So this relation is valuable for pointing to community, domain, institution specific sample data, which is usually available via the web. Like DOIs, uh, other data site connection metadata, including name identifiers, affiliation identifiers, and funding references, enable the connection of IGSN IDs to other resources in the PID graph. Okay, so let's just very quickly see how some of these are represented in data site commons. 
So uh, findable IGSN IDs are discoverable in data site commons, again, in the same way as other DOIs. Uh, the common surfaces sample information, such as the title, resource type, description, alternate identifier from the data site metadata. And here you can see that the creator is linked using an ORCID ID, um, and that the person's ORCID metadata and records can then be explored uh, in the people tab uh, link uh, in commons as well. Um, the creator affiliation is linked to using a raw ID, which likewise can be explored via the organizations tab link. Um, and you can also see that a contributor is included in the data site metadata. In this case, it's the hosting institution of the sample and is again identified by a raw ID. Um, as discussed earlier, you can use related Meta, uh, related identifier metadata to connect IGSN IDs to other research outputs and resources that cite a sample identified by an IGSN ID. Such connections between samples and other DOIs are also displayed in commons. And here we can see a journal article that references the IGSN ID is represented as a citation on the IGSN ID's metadata page. Um, and relationships among parts, um, for example, uh, among parents, samples and children, as well as among features of interest and in samples taken from them, can also be represented in the PID graph. Is part, if, is part of or has part relation types are used in the related identifier metadata? These relationships can be queried using the GraphQL API, um, where GraphQL queries enable us to explore nested relationships and metadata among IGSN IDs, for example, to see the parts of a sample and then its parts, associated people and institutions and more. Um, and in, so in summary, connection metadata and data site services such as Commons, Event Data and GraphQL enable us to explore connections among IGSN IDs and other PIDs, both visually and via our APIs. And we're really excited to continue to develop the PID ecosystem around IGSN IDs as the IGSN data site partnership develops. So um, just a quick to end with a very quick plug, um, data site will have a physical meeting, the first one in X number of years in Gothenburg in 2023, connected with the 20th uh, RDA plenary. Um, if you want to find out more, please go to the data site website, but we'd be very pleased to have you come and join us if you happen to be going to uh, the RDA 20th plenary meeting. Um, and that's it. Oh, uh, one last thing as well. If you're a data site member, please fill in the member survey if you haven't already done so. And talking of which, please don't forget our participant survey at the end of the webinar when you exit. Um, and now we've got some very, very quick time for Q&A. And I apologize that we've overrun the talks very slightly. But uh, let me stop sharing and uh, uh, we can have a look at uh, what we have received. Right. Um, so uh, if everybody wants, to, if uh, Penny, Jens and Sean, you want to turn your cameras on as well, um, then we can have a look at what we've got. So. Um, uh, Rolf's question, I think it's a, it's a question that I can answer fairly quickly. That is about oh. uh, embargoes um, and um, so the, there's two parts to this. There's the, um, depending on what you want to disclose or not disclose, the one is what you want to have on your landing page. And it's in the control of the owner of the landing page to, to control what they want to show on the landing page and at what time. A um, different question is what you do with the metadata that you put into the data set catalog. That's a bit more complex, um, but it's also possible to put in placeholder values into the data site metadata that say, yes, uh, we, this the metadata field exists, but we cannot tell you anything about it. We have these um, cases in minerals exploration where um, parts of the metadata or whole records um, cannot be displayed to the public for a time out of confidentiality reasons, out of cultural norms reasons. There are many reasons why sometimes you cannot disclose information, and that is certainly possible 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even the mandatory, most of the mandatory metadata fields in the data site metadata schema, you can put a standard value to basically say this value is unknown or this value can't be shared or doesn't exist or, or what have you. And, and obviously, this also comes back to the fact that you may not initially have all of the, the metadata, especially when you're in the field, you might only have some of the elements or the very minimal elements, but you want to update that record over time. So obviously enrichment of, of the metadata fields is very important. Um, and you can you can obviously do that and in a similar sort of way. So um, embargoing you could sort of think of as handling in a, in a similar type of way that you release some of the metadata, but over time you can release more and more. Um, Okay, and then we have uh, a question from Moritz Hanneman. In Daphne, we not only have material samples, but also recipes for in situ experiments. Are there plans to support them as well, or is there already a way to effectively get an IGSN for them? Uh, so I'm not sure what a recipe for an in situ experiment is, so I will def possibly defer on, on that one um, a little bit. Um, does anybody else uh, of the other panelists know what recipes for in situ experiments might be? Um, otherwise, Moritz, can you maybe quickly, I know we've got very little time, but quickly clarify uh, that, uh, because I'm not quite sure that means. I mean, yes, you, you can certainly use IGSN IDs for experimental sites, um, but I and there are plans to include uh, instruments very soon in data site schema 4.5. There are people thinking about tool pins for tools um, that will also possibly come in the future. Um, so uh, where tools here are more sort of electronic notebook type tools, I think, rather than than actual um, different to instruments. Um, but I don't know the answer to that without necessarily knowing what the uh, what what you mean by that. I think someone's put a question in the chat. Ah, wait a minute. Ah, this means we create the sample during the experiment, and the sample is more or less immediately destroyed as well. Um, well, yes, I think that's perfectly within scope. Uh, I don't see any reason why. That wouldn't be. I think it's uh, one we could talk with you more about, about Moritz. I think it certainly sounds very interesting, and I'd, I'd like to discuss that more with you um, about that I, use case. I see some parallel to um, one of our use cases where we take water samples, take a measurement, and then discard the sample. And um, exactly, so the the sample doesn't have to persist. We just want to have an identity of that we did this. There was a sampling process that uh, generated data. Uh, so uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from Ronald. I think my colleague is typing an answer to the first of those. So Ro Ronald uh, Namwaza, and I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correct. So um, how is data site metadata schema different to that of CCAN? I will let my colleague just, just, uh, answer that because we've run out of time. Um, but also how can I become a member of data site? Ronald, if we have your contact details anywhere, I will contact you personally to talk to you about that because we would definitely love to um, have a discussion with you and your organization about uh, becoming a data site member. Um, but I'm afraid, and I apologize again that the talks went a tiny bit <laughs> over, that we've run out of time. But if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. You will have a copies of the slides in this video, so you will have uh, the contact information there to get in contact with DataSite. Please do so, and I will definitely be, uh, me or my colleagues will definitely be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, now or, or in the future. Okay, so I think it just remains for me to thank um, my fellow speakers, so to Penny, to Jens and Sean, and thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate uh, you all joining us. I know possibly a little bit early for some of you. Um, and yes, again, please, uh, if you want to come to Data Site Connect, let us know. If you 
Uh, I remember fill in the survey and also as you exit, please fill in the participants survey so that we know how we can do things better in the future. Um, or if everything was perfect and we can go and celebrate with a beer. So thank you very much, everyone. Take care.